Okay, so we might get started. So thank you, everybody. My name is Shira Lee and I'm from Tamworth Library. And I'd like to welcome you to our virtual author talk today with Peter O'Brien. Now, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the Gamilaroi people who are the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. So as I've just mentioned, I have muted everybody. And also if you could just keep your videos turned off, that would be great. Now we are recording this session, so you will be able to view it at a later time when we do um, put it up on our website. We would also love for you to be able to ask Peter some questions. So if you have questions, just pop them in the chat box and we'll go through them once we've had a little bit of a chat. Now, before we get to Peter though, um, I am very honoured to introduce another author that first captured our hearts as an actor and now writes wonderful novels that have positioned her as one of Australia's leading fiction writers. Her name is of course, Judy Nunn, and I'll just turn her, ask her to turn her video on. And she's joining us today to launch Bush School. So thank you so much for joining us, Judy, and I will hand over to you. Oh, thank you, Shirley. Uh, well, good to be here. And of course, a great, great honour to be launching this divine book by Peter O'Brien called Bush School. Uh, now, actually, I have to say quite a little while back, I was asked by the impossible to say no to Jane Palfreman of Allen and Unwin Publishing uh, to write a sort of a mini review for Peter's wonderful book so that she could uh, nick a little catch line out of it to stick on the front of the book, which I did. And the, the uh, chosen line was, uh, there is charm and warmth on every page. And indeed there is, but of course there's a great deal more too. Now, Jane also published the mini little thing that I did inside the front of the book. And I opened up with this. I said, so many wonderful plays, books and films centre upon the importance of a dedicated and inspiring teacher in the lives of the very young. The reason is simple. Such teachers, and they are indeed rare, have a lifetime influence upon their pupils. I believe this to be so. I certainly know it happened to me. I was 10 years old and I will remember Ted Hamilton till the day I die. Uh, and of course, so many great uh, works of art, plays and films, etc., have their theme has been inspired and passionate teachers. I mean, if you just look at it, there was the wonderful The Corn is Green play by the wonderful uh, Welsh playwright, Emily Williams. There was the perennial, of course, uh, Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Uh, there was The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, Dead Poet Society, you name them. That's just off the top of my head. Uh, inspired teachers uh, make for inspired themes. Uh, and I then concluded, uh, well, finished that little section of my little review with these words. I said, I believe Peter O'Brien is such a teacher. And I do believe that. So as well as the warmth and charm, there is passion and inspiration. And if, so much in Bush School, uh, it's funny, it's poignant, it's touching, it's informative, it's evocative of a bygone era. It, there's so much there. In other words, it's a damn good all round read. So I would like now to officially declare uh, Bush School launched and I'd like to raise a glass, not only of course to you dear Peter, but also to Jane and your wonderful team at Allen and Unwin. And there is another author who is going to join me very quickly in the toast. Hello Peter, uh, congratulations on a job well done mate. And uh, uh, here's the here's Bush, Bush School. What's Bush School. Wassail. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Judy. My pleasure. Okay, so now we're going to go over to Peter. And welcome, Peter. Thank you for uh, choosing Tamworth Library to launch your, your fabulous book, Bush School. Now, of course... Um, I hope I don't offend you in saying this, but I will let everybody know that you are currently in your 80s and you did, you were teaching at Way of Bonga when you were 20. So two questions for you. Firstly, why did it take you so long to write the book and how do you possibly remember everything? The second question is a better one. So I'll try <laughs> to answer that first of all. Um, 
the way that I remembered everybody was, was quite strange. The people that I went to teachers college with, and I can see some of them are actually linked in. Hi to all of those people from Balmain Teachers College from 56 and 57. We had a reunion, a 60 year reunion in 2017. And one of the fellows at that reunion suggested that all of us who had had one teacher school experience should write a little bit about it because it was historically of interest and was important. So I responded and said, yes, of course, I'll, I'll write a couple of thousand words, thinking that that would be my absolute limit, that I would not have the memory necessary to go beyond that. But as soon as I write, Shirley, I found myself back in that little room and I found all the children around me and they were talking to me. It was quite an extraordinary experience. As soon as I opened up my memory, all of the children came flooding in and they filled in all the gaps that I thought would be impossible to fill. So that's how it came to be that I had enough to write a long story about those couple of years. Why I waited so long? Oh, well, uh, 60 years, that's early enough, I think. Fair enough, fair enough. Now, of course, this book has special meaning for our area because uh, Wayabonga is not far from Tamworth. So I haven't been there yet, although I, have, I do say that having read your book, it's certainly on the top of my Sunday drive list and I will definitely take a drive out there, although I imagine it's snowing there today, so perhaps not today. But for those who may not be familiar with where it is, could you explain whereabouts it is and how you travelled to get there at the time? Well, it is between Tamworth, where you are, Shirley, and Walker. And a couple of the people who are on the link, I think, may be from Walker. There are some people on the link who live in Weabonga, which is great for them to be there as well. So it's about halfway, I suppose, between Tamworth and Walker. Tamworth is in the Valley of the Peel, as you know, and Walker is up on top of the divide. So Weabonga is much higher than Tamworth. You go to the east from Tamworth, driving along a beautiful drive. I can only recommend that you do it, Shirley. I will. It is a beautiful drive out to Weabonga. You go along the valley of the Peel. And at the end of the valley, you come to the Port Stephens Cutting, which takes you up a, quite a, a height. I think you go up about 800 metres up the Port Stephens Cutting up almost onto the top of the Great Divide. And that's where Weabonga sits, just under the top. Weabonga is about uh, 800 metres, maybe a bit more than 800 metres. So it probably is snowing there today from all that I hear. Um, it's not the easiest drive because the main road does not go to Weabonga. You have to diverge from the main road onto the road into Weabonga itself. Uh, there is no reason to go to Weabonga <laughs> except to go to Weabonga and nobody ever goes through Weabonga unless they're going deliberately to Weabonga. It's a beautiful drive though, Shirley, so please do it. And, and tell us about your journey in getting there when you first had to go there. I uh, had a, a small experience at a city school and then I got an appointment to the country, but I was appointed to a place called Guy Fawkes, which is between Armadale and the coast, again, up on top of the range. But when I got to Guy Fawkes, I found there were only six students there and one can't open a school with only six students. You have to have an average of 10 to have a small school. So I contacted the inspector who was in Armadale, told him the numbers and he said, you can't open the school come back into Armadale and we'll work out where I'll appoint you. So back to Armadale I went and he offered me a choice of three schools, one of which was Ward's Mistake. Now Ward's Mistake did not appeal to me, I have to say. I thought if Ward, who was a bush ranger, I think, Ward was Captain Moonlight or Captain Starlight, something like that. I thought if he'd made a mistake, then I wasn't going to repeat it. So I wasn't interested in Ward's mistake. Another school that I can't even remember the name of, and Weabonga. And the 
inspector did not try to sell me Weabonga. The inspector was quite honest about it. He said it was his most remote school. It was the most difficult of his schools to staff and he was very concerned about the standards of the students at that school. It was obvious to me that that's where he wanted me to go because he wanted someone who, who would go there and stay for two years, work consistently with the students and bring up the standards in the school. So having worked out that that's where the inspector wanted me to go, I was still young enough, still very green and naive to think the best thing to do was to say yes to the inspector. So I said, yes, well, I'll go to Weibonga. And he was very pleased indeed. Now, I'm sure coming from Sydney, it was a bit of a culture shock when you arrived there. And this was probably not helped by the house that you first lived in. So could you tell us a bit about that house and the people that you were staying with? Uh, being in Weabong was quite a shock to me. It's not even a village. There are still only five houses in Weabonga. But before I go on any further, I have to just say that I also acknowledge the Kalimaroi Kamala Roy people. Um, the Kamala Roy people have been in that and looking after that area for 60,000 years. It is a gorgeous area. The whole of the Kamala Roy land is just gorgeous place. So thanks to the Kamala Roy people and I acknowledge them. But when I got to Weabonga, there were five houses scattered uh, over quite a distance. So it's a, a very small hamlet. It was a shock. I had come from the city. I wasn't prepared for this. I wasn't prepared in any way, really, for what the country was about to ask me to do with my life. But coming into Weabonga, the mail car driver who was uh, driving me there, indicated a house that I was going to stay. I was not impressed. In fact, I was taken aback. It was a weatherboard house and it looked to be in very bad repair and very poorly maintained. It had never been painted. There had been no treatment of the weatherboards in the life of this house. So it presented as a very unappealing house. I was greeted at the door by the landlady, my future landlady, Jill, and shown into the house where I immediately lost myself. It was such a contrast coming from the sun into the front room, which was so dark that I couldn't see. So I put my suitcase down on the floor and said, Jill, Jill, I'm lost. Can you please tell me where to go? I thought, what a deal. Jill must think I'm a total deal. Anyway, Jill came back, took me out to the front veranda and showed me on the front veranda a bed. Between the bed and the roadway was some tar paper, paper impregnated with tar. That was it. That was where I was going to stay for the next two years. A bed on a veranda, shielded from the rain and the snow by a bit of tar paper. Wow. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what the families in the area did? What did they do for work and so forth? There was a mixture, of course. The five houses in the village had families in each of them. Uh, and the men in those families typically worked on the properties roundabout. They were day labourers and they sold their labour to the graziers. Around the village, of course, were the grazing properties and some of the children came from the grazing properties as well. They were sheep grazing at that time, a little bit of cattle, but sheep grazing. And during the 50s, the price of wool had climbed back to quite a, a record peaks almost. Uh, if you, any of you who are with us today remember back to the 50s, you'll remember there was a great deal of excitement about wool being a pound a pound, which was a terrific price for wool. So the grazing families were doing quite well by the early 60s. They had not always been doing well. They had suffered through some very bad times indeed. But by the time I got there, they were doing very well. The families in the village were subsistence 
really. They depended on the work that could come from the grazing properties around about. They all had vegetable gardens. There was a village common and the families in the village had some head of stock that they ran on the common. So they had sheep that they could breed and they might have some cattle that they could breed a vela. Uh, but really they depended very much on subsistence for their livelihoods. So there was a mixture of not, not absolute poverty, but people living with financial challenges surrounded by farming properties where the people were doing quite well. Okay. Now, we'll come to your first day of school. How were you feeling? What were you expecting? And what actually happened? Well, I thought I might just read a little bit from the book. Sure. Um, <laughs> for school. Uh, the first day was quite exciting. Uh, I had no idea what to expect, but 18 children turned up with their parents and I enrolled 18. The parents left just before nine o'clock and I was ready to welcome the children, but I couldn't find them. <laughs> there were no children. <laughs> no, no children anywhere near the schoolroom. So I had to go out and find them. And I just wanted to read this little bit. Lovely. When the parents left saying their goodbyes, I stood on the veranda ready to invite the children to join me in the schoolroom. Were they? Not one was anywhere near the entr entryway. As I searched for the children, the words of an aged farm reared aunt came to mind. Upon hearing of my appointment to a remote country school, she'd given some spontaneous advice. Bush children run and hide at the sight of strangers. Give them time and be gentle. You'll do all right if you keep that in mind. Never rush them. This had made me smile, although I'd accepted that the words were probably wise. The children were scattered about the yard and well towards the fences. Boys were with boys under the four huge pines on the furthest boundary and girls with girls down near the school gate, below the path and its long lines of clipped privet hedge on either side. Not wanting to shout the first words they would hear from me, gentle, be gentle, I walked nearer to each group and quietly asked them to join me inside. Then I sat at my desk and waited. And I waited quite a while. <laughs> as long as they came eventually, that's, <laughs> that's cool. They did come in eventually uh, in little dribs and drabs and settled down and we began to chat. And then suddenly a huge ball of, of boys turned up in the room. About eight boys came bundling into the room all together, a bit of noise, arms around each other's shoulders, and by then we had the 18 children with me. Now, I believe that you were ahead of your time when it came to how you wanted the school to be run. You were very specific in making sure that the kids had a lot of say in their own education. Now, this was quite unusual for the time, wasn't it? Very unusual for the time, Shirley. Uh, schools were very organised and very regimented back in the 50s, working up to the 60s. There was a set syllabus and every subject had a, a curriculum for it. Um, there were times that you had to devote each week to each subject area. The rooms were set up with the tables screwed to the floor so that nobody could ever move. All the children lined up before school at recess and lunch and they all marched in with their arms swinging and they sat in their chair and they were there to learn. Um, they were encouraged occasionally to ask a question, but it was all very teacher led and teacher directed. I had had a little bit of experience at a city school and that did not suit me, surely. It was not my style. So how do you go about teaching 18 children between five and 15 in one? Well, I, as you said, I wanted to be centered on the children, what they wanted to learn. Nevertheless, I had to be very organized mm -hmm. and I was, I spent a lot of time each day at that little school. I'd be there just after seven 
and I would leave when it got dark. So I'd be there from 7.15 to 5.30, 5.45 every day. And I worked on the weekends as well. When I had arrived at the school and looked at the store that the school held, it held very little. There was almost no teaching material and very little to work with. So if anything needed to be ready for the children, I had to make it, I had to do it. So it was a lot of work. But within that, I tried to focus on what the children wanted to learn. They all had ideas, they all had things that they were interested in and keen to know about. So we tried to focus our teaching and our instruction on the things they wanted to do. So to make it really child-centered. Yeah, I love how you do that. And I, I love how you, like with maths, you incorporated how they would work out how many sheep per acre or how many sheep are shorn in a day and things like that. So was that, had you always planned on doing it that way or that sort of happened organically to keep them in, interested? Uh, it happened organically. I mean, they did ask questions. Children everywhere ask questions that have a maths background or a question about English or whatever. And if a teacher is aware, they can incorporate all of that into the syllabus, into the curriculum for the children. So I just had my ears open all the time, waiting for the children to bring up a topic or an interest that they had that I could see, yeah, there's a real learning opportunity there. We can grab that and we can run with it. In doing that, what I found, Shirley, is that we covered the set curriculum anyway. I mean, the children yes. wanted to learn to read, they wanted to learn maths, they wanted to learn skills. So we covered the curriculum anyway, just picking up on the ideas that the children brought forward. Yep, perfect. Now, one of the things to happen that made your life more enjoyable in Wayabonga was meeting Perse and Ethel. Could you tell us a bit about them? Well, I described to you how my living conditions were not optimal to tell you. And uh, I was finding it very challenging. In fact, I'd made up my mind uh, just before the end of the first term that I was going to resign, that the conditions were so challenging that they were getting on top of me and I was feeling quite anxious and quite stressed, not because of the children. I loved being with the children and we had wonderful days together, but just the conditions of life were so challenging that I had made up my mind that I could not last there. And I had decided after the Easter break that I would resign if the inspector did not transfer me to a better situation. The week that I made that decision, I was coming home from the school one afternoon when I noticed Purse. I didn't know his name was Purse at the time, but I noticed Purse in his front yard. So I crossed the road and introduced myself to Purse who I found to be a delightful chap, into his late 70s, but very bright, very alert, very interested in who I was. And he asked me to go in to share afternoon tea with Ethel, who was his sister, and with Purse himself. I put that off till the next day. So the next day I arrived, I left the school a little earlier so that we could have a pleasant afternoon tea together. And Perth showed me over their compound where they lived. The first part of the compound was a tin hut right on the roadway. It was an unlined tin hut and it was falling up, falling down, surely. It was literally on its last legs. And it seemed to me to be held up only by the vines that were crawling all over it. Hurst told me that this had been the court of petty sessions. His father had been appointed as the magistrate to the court of petty sessions in Weabonga. Weabonga had had a gold rush and there had been between 500 and 1,000 people there. There were many mines, uh, four or five hotels, billiard parlours, stores and so on. So there had been the need for a court of petty sessions. It had been built as a tin hut and Purse's dad had been appointed there as the magistrate. So Purse and Ethel, as very young children, had come there in 1890. Wow. So that was the first hut, and that was Purse's hut. He'd made that into his bedroom, but it was a totally unlined tin shed. Just a little bit down the hill from that was the hut that 
Ethel slept in. That was a weatherboard hut and it was lined, so it was more comfortable than Purse's. And then Purse took me further down the hill to another tin shed, again, unlined, no ceiling, just tin nailed to bits of tree, really. And this is where Purse and Ethel spent all their time. This was their living area. Inside that shed, which had no light apart from the door, there was a fireplace. And over oh, that fireplace, Purse and Ethel did all their cooking. They had no oven, no stove, just an open fire. There was a tired old lounge chair in front of the fire, which was Ethel's chair. And there was a, a table, which was made by banging a couple of stumps into the ground and lying slabs on top of that. There were a couple of slab stools on either side of that. The floor was dirt. The floor of the hut where uh, Purse slept was also dirt. The floor in Ethel's hut was a wooden floor, but the two other huts were dirt floors. Uh, to say that I was shocked by the conditions in which these two lovely old people was living uh, was an understatement. I was totally blown away by the way that these two elderly people were living, but they were used to it. They were very comfortable. They were quite happy for me to be coming in and sharing afternoon tea with them. That, was, that afternoon tea started a whole series of afternoon teas. We met two or three times a week after that. They were delightful. They were they cared for me so much. They looked after me, they cosseted me, they facilitated me. They wanted me to be happy in Weerbonga and they did everything they possibly could to make that happen. They were gorgeous and I loved them. Oh, that's fabulous. It's, uh, you, you bring up some great pictures in my mind there of what it must have been like. Now, some of the other things that you did too that made your life a little more enjoyable was by playing tennis and rugby. So that helped you meet a few more people. Can you tell us a little bit about those? I, the first uh, four or six weeks that I was there, I spent every Sunday in the school getting ready for the next week. So I was actually unaware that there was tennis being played. There was a tennis court in the middle of the village, but I was unaware that tennis was actually played on it until my landlord told me once, Saturday that there would be tennis on that court and that anybody was free to go. So about the sixth or seventh week that I was there, I joined the tennis party and found there are something like eight adults who were there that afternoon playing tennis. Now I had been totally, totally bereft of adult company. The landlady and the landlord were good people but they did not spend time with me in any sense of a social interaction. They tried to care for me, they fed me, etc. but we had no conversation, almost of any sort. So I had the children in the day and was totally on my own after that. Somewhere in the book I say that I started to talk to myself, which I did after the kids left in the afternoon. I found myself holding conversations simply to hear a voice, simply to hear an adult voice. I was that lonely and that isolated. Anyhow, I started at the tennis and found that there were these very pleasant people, adults, who came together every Sunday afternoon to play tennis. The week after I'd met Purse and Ethel, the two lovely old people, a young man turned up at the tennis that I had not met before and I didn't know anything about and he introduced himself as Paul Williamson. I have to say at this stage that I changed all the names of all the people at Weabonga. They're all fictitious names. So I'll continue to call Paul, Paul Williamson. Paul introduced himself said he'd come to the tennis particularly to meet me because he wanted to recruit me to play rugby union in the Tamworth Rugby Club. That opened up a whole new area of my life, which was terrific. Excellent. Now, before you moved to Weyabonga, you were already courting a young lady by the name of Patricia. 
who, by the way, comes across as the most amazing, fabulous woman. I love Patricia. Well, I'm glad you agree with me about that. <laughs> but how hard was it to maintain the relationship when you were both so far apart? <laughs> it was extraordinarily difficult. Um, going back to 1960, the only communication that we had by, was either by letter or by phone. There was a phone available for me on the veranda of one of the houses and that was a public phone, um, to ring to Melbourne where Patricia had taken herself was long distance and long distance was very expensive in 1960. I think it cost me something like six shillings for three minutes. So I could only do one phone call a week and that always happened on a Saturday morning. But I wrote lots of letters and Patricia wrote back to me as well. So we continued to communicate in that way. Every Saturday morning, I also took advantage of the call to sing one of the things that had attracted Patricia to me was that I sang Johnny O'Keefe songs. And Patricia liked Johnny O'Keefe. And so each Saturday morning during my call or to end the call, I would sing a song. Well, that just sounds fabulous. <laughs> Now, at some stage, you did upgrade your living conditions. So how did that come about? Well, when Paul took me into Tamworth to join the rugby club, on the way back from Tamworth to Weabonga that afternoon, late in the afternoon, uh, we were accompanied by Paul's dad, George, uh, an older man. And George said to me on the way back, would you like to come and spend the night with us in our homestead on our property? And uh, I said, oh, oh, no, 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 don't worry about that. Hoping that he would say, no, no, you must come, which he did. He immediately said, no, 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 you must come. So, of course, I went and I had a delightful night uh, with the Williamston family in their homestead on their property. There was George and Paul, the only boy, and one of the four girls was there. George was a widower, the mother of the family had been dead for some time, and the four girls were now adults, and a couple of them took it in turn to come home to care for their dad. So that first night that I was there, there were three of the Williamsons and myself. It was simply delightful. When we got up for breakfast the next morning, we had breakfast on the side veranda in the sun, overlooking the paddock leading down to the Swamp Oak Creek. Delightful breakfast, lovely company. At the end of the breakfast, while we were having our second or third cup of tea, George said, Peter, we have something to suggest to you. I thought, what might this be? I have no expectation. And George said, Peter, we'd like you to come and live with us. Well, I was just bowled over. I had spent the night in a very comfortable bed in a very comfortable bedroom. I'd had a shower in the morning in a proper bathroom, properly equipped. There was a proper kitchen, well equipped. It was like walking into paradise to be invited to come and share their life with them in that glorious homestead. So I accepted the invitation. No, that sounds... Unsurpri unsurprisingly. Unsurprisingly, yes. Okay. <laughs> so we might open it up soon for some questions. So if people would like to write something in the chat box and we can pass them along to Peter. Everybody is agreeing with me at how fabulous uh, Patricia is. We've all loved Patricia, <laughs> so make sure that she, she, she knows that. So we've got some other people that have also worked in remote areas. So one of the things that I did love um, also, Peter, for me was the fact that, you know, there was no running water, there was no electricity. Um, the food you were eating to start with was, was quite limited. So it was really fascinating to sort of hear about those times, which obviously I have not experienced. Um, how did you cope with all of that? Not well. Uh, it was not until I went to live with the Williamsons on their property that things settled down. Um, 
Percy and Ethel really helped me to settle down. And then within a week, I was living with the Williamsons and that changed my life entirely. I was able to relax. I was able to stop worrying about myself and my living conditions. And I was able to start concentrating on the children. I became fully available to the children. I was there with them and open to them, ready to work with them to the best of my ability. Up until then, of course, there were hesitations and worries and concerns I had at the back of the mind. So I hadn't been fully available to the kids. So it was wonderful for me to realize that I was now ready to be a full professional and ready to work to the best of my ability with those kids. Um, once I went to live with the Williams and yes, there were still wood stoves in the kitchen. There were, there was no electricity. Uh, there was light that we had to get from lamps each evening. Um, there was no way to iron your clothes except with a lump of iron, a lump of iron that you put on top of the stove to up with a handle, a detachable handle that you transferred lumps of iron between. Everything in that village, in all of those homes, had to be done by physical labour. The women in those five village houses I came to admire and respect so much because everything they did they had to do from their own resources they had no machinery they had no power it was just them and they presented themselves their husbands and their children always in the most impeccable way clean clothes iron clothes everybody came out of their home always looking so well presented i really admired these women and I admired the work that everybody in that village did. They were all terrific people. Oh, absolutely. I take my hat off to them. I, luckily, I don't have to wonder about how to do that. So, no. but, but it was great to hear about it. Now, we've got some questions coming through, which is great. So we've got one here saying, within a few pages, I realised you were an educational revolutionary. Was there any resistance to your wonderful engaging methods? None at all. Uh, the children loved it. Uh, the families who sent the children to the school wanted me to be there. They supported me wholeheartedly. They were happy with what I was doing with the children. So they had no hesitation about accepting what I was doing. And I was on my own, Shirley. I had an inspectorial visit three times in two years. The inspector came for no more than two to two and a half hours, three times in two years. I was on my own. I could have been burying those kids under the floorboards <laughs> and nobody would have known. So there was no opposition or challenge to what I was doing, which was terrific because it really allowed me to work out how do you do this? How do you have child-centred education? And I could give it a full go, knowing that there was going to be no criticism from anybody if it worked. As long as the children were learning, then things yeah. would be okay. Sure, okay. Um, Vivian says, interesting to hear from Peter the broader issue of rural poverty, which was so common in rural Australia for many years. Yes, I think... Um, people don't realise that rural poverty kept on after the Great Depression. The Great Depression set everybody back, of course, but particularly people in the country. And people in the country, many areas in the country did not recover financially from that Great Depression. And uh, right up until the 50s and the 60s, people were still living in, in forms of poverty quite unknown in the city. So there were little pockets of poverty scattered everywhere through rural mm. New South Wales and I expect through rural Australia. Um, Tony S, why is there not a photo of Peter on the inside front cover of the book? That's a question that we'll put to Jane Paul from and the publisher. <laughs> or to Laura Benson, who is the publicist for Alan and Unwin. Alan and Unwin are the top publishers in Australia. I heard Judy congratulating them. Uh, in the Australian Book Industry Awards. There's Jane. Oh, sorry, I just took her off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Jane P. She is. Ask Jane P. Why well, there's no photo of P. It was a terrible <laughs> oversight on our part, and uh, I don't know. We don't usually put photos in. That's all I can say. There you go. If you need a photo, get out your cameras now or your phones and take a photo of me on, on the screen. Um, somebody else said, I think Peter's life at Wayabonga would have been so much better had he had a car. It became better when I did get a car. I went across to Perth where Judy Nunn comes from. Judy Nunn is a West Australian, a Perth person. I went to Perth for a holiday in between 60 and 61. And while I was there, I bought a car, drove the car back right across the Nullarbor Plain, 3,000 miles of dirt road, and turned up the first day of the first term in the second year with a car. That car made life a lot easier for me. Before then, I was totally dependent upon the people of Weabonga for any transport. And I was really isolated. Without a car in the country, you're isolated. And I was really mm. isolated in that little village. Now, a question from Kate and Chris. Was there a particular reason for changing the names of the characters in the book? Yes, I didn't ask their permission to write about them. And I did not want their privacy to be invaded by anybody. All of the uh, people who live in Weabonga now, know exactly who I'm writing about. They all know who the characters are. But I didn't believe that the world needed to know that, so I deliberately chose to change the names. Fair enough. Now, do you know what happened to Person Ethel? Person Ethel, fairly soon after I left, uh, began to suffer physical ailments. Up until then, they had both been pretty good. Uh, they lived a very challenging lifestyle. Uh, they had very little money, so they had nothing uh, to, to indulge themselves with. They were both tall, relatively thin, relatively fit. But soon after I went um, away from Weabonga, their health began to deteriorate. And I heard that medical intervention became necessary. They were moved into a, an aged care facility in Tamworth and they did not last long there. When I was leaving Weabonga on the last of my days there in 1961, Hearst and Ethel were at the side of the road. They stopped me. I got out of the car. We hugged each other. We gave each other a kiss. That was the last I ever saw of them. I never did get back to Weabonga to see Person Ethel again, and they died relatively soon after I'd, I'd left. It's always been a great regret in my life that I didn't get to see Person Ethel. Two of the people that I loved most in my life, I didn't get to see them again. Hmm. Um. Michael asks, what is the one thing that you carried with you from Weabonga that helped you in your life? And also, is there any chance of a Johnny O'Keefe song? <laughs> um, yes to both, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did I take away from Weabonga? I take away the, the basic decency and goodness and kindness of people. I took away from there. When I went to Weabonga, I was fairly optimistic about people. Um, in some senses, I'm, I'm optimistic to the point of being naive. I expect that people are good, are decent, are kind. And I prefer to always have that opinion at the front of my mind. And not until people prove otherwise will I drop that opinion. But being at Weabonga really cemented that with me, that the majority of people that you meet mean well. They are good people. They're decent, kind people, and given a chance, they will care for you. That's one of the things that I took away. I also took away confidence about child-centred education, which uh, informed my educational practice from then on. Okay. Well, we might hold the song over until the end. Um, Mark asks, how many times did you get back to Sydney, and how difficult was it when you had to leave um, to go back to Weabonga? Uh, I got back to Sydney very infrequently in the first year, uh, maybe once or twice only. Patricia had moved to 
Melbourne and was working there at Channel 7. And in the second year when I had a car, I was able to get down to Sydney a little more frequently. And Patricia was kind enough to arrange to come up to Sydney to see her family and to meet with me several times during the first and second term of, of 1961. So I got to Sydney maybe five or six times in the second year. I flew down on one occasion on Butler Air Transport DC-3. It was a pretty terrifying trip, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I didn't repeat it, I preferred to drive. But I did get down to Sydney four or five times in that second year. Okay. Um... Now, it looks like we do have um, some of your past students on here, perhaps. Um, but I have got a number of people asking for a rendition of Over the Mountain. Over the mountain, beyond every stream, it's you that I'm calling, calling to me. Over the mountains, the girl waits for me. Oh, yeah. Now you can see why I sang that song. <laughs> Patricia was over the mountain. She was down in Melbourne. I was over the mountain in Weabonga. So that was typically the Saturday morning song. Over ah. <laughs> that was fabulous. Did, did, did you enjoy that? I did. <laughs> I did, absolutely. Um, so, yes, I've got Chris Clare saying that I remember you clearly and the two years you spent at Wayabonga. Thanks for that memory. And what else have I got here? Okay, so people are saying that, yes, when you, you um, do a reprint, we'll have to put your photo in the book. Um, did you, oh, here's another question. Did you get a sense that the locals had much awareness of the world outside of the area? Um, to a different degree amongst the people. The, the people in the village, I think, lived a very um, focused life on that village and the life in the village. They had to work very hard. They didn't have time to be concerned about life elsewhere. They did have radios and they typically listened to the local Tamworth radio station, which um, was very country focused. <laughs> it didn't have a great deal of news on it at the time. It had a lot of country style music. That's what turned Tamworth into the country music center of the world, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, they were not well aware of the outside world. But the people who lived on the properties roundabout were, and particularly the Williamson family with whom I lived, George was retired. He spent most of his day on the veranda in the sun or inside at the fire, reading, reading papers. They got papers delivered two or three times a week through the mail car. And George listened a lot to the ABC. And he was very well aware of what was happening in the world. It was George who taught me a lot about what was happening in Africa, for example. Africa okay. was in turmoil at, at that time. Many of the Africans were gaining independence, were leaving their colonial status behind. George was very well aware of, of what was happening in the world. But a lot of the people in the village uh, were not that interested. They simply had to spend their time and their energy caring for the family and caring for themselves. Now, I do have a message here that lets me know that it is actually your 58th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Who sent you that? <laughs> that is true. 58 years. 58 I've known, years? I've known Patricia for so long. <laughs> but it is our 58th wedding anniversary tomorrow. So congratulations, Patricia. Congratulations to the both of you. And I have a message that says, Patricia says, you can see why I married Peter. And that was after your lovely song. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't she lovely? Isn't still, she lovely? Still just as gorgeous as she was when we met when we were 18 or 19. 
Now, someone has also just mentioned here about um, a friend who lives at Kentucky remembers his mother collecting a box of books set, sent up on the train from Tamworth Library. Were books also sent to Wayobonga via the mailman? Uh, look, that was after my time. We didn't get boxes of books from the Tamworth Library when I was there. Um, what a wonderful thing to do, to actually start sending books to a country school. When I was there, the only books that came into the place I brought. So when I came down to Sydney for a holiday or a break, I would always take books back with me. Those were the only books that we actually had in the school. Okay. Now, what I might do is I'll bring Judy back in. I'll just um, get Judy. If you'd like to pop your video screen back on again. And I will let people know if you're living locally, uh, our Collins Booksellers in Tamworth does have copies of Peter's book in stock. So you are welcome to um, go in and purchase a copy. And we also will have some available to... Uh, borrow from the library as well. Welcome back, Judy. Can you, can we hear you? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Thank you. I pressed the right buttons. Whoa. <laughs> well done. So I would like to thank both of you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure having a, having a chat. It's been a lot of fun and we even got serenaded. So what more can you ask for? <laughs> I think many of us know uh, that the courting song, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, and Peter, I tell you, who has, has clocked into from everywhere, from your gorgeous, there was an ex-student you had. I'd love to have seen a picture of that. But guess who else was on the line too? Jackie Weaver, who will be coming. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that just gorgeous? Sure. It is and a lovely Tamara photo. From Sweden, science, Tamara. Uh, yeah. Tamara yeah. from Sweden. We've had a lot of people from all over the place. So it's fantastic, definitely. I just want to tell everybody that there is a Facebook page. I'm sure that there are lots of questions and lots of things people want to say and we don't have time for them. So there is a Facebook page, Bush School by Peter O'Brien. And if you've got anything that you would like to say or to send to me, please do through that Facebook page, Bush School by Peter O'Brien. Excellent. Sounds fantastic. Great. So I'll wrap it up there. Thank you everyone for coming in. It was fantastic. And thank you again to Judy and Peter. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, thank Peter. you. Bye bye, thank Judy. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, turn your visions on so turn we can all wave. On turn your visions on. All. <laughs> oh, all those people. There's science in Sweden. There's science from Stockholm. Hello, Stockholm. Hello, Stockholm. And someone from Ad Abu Dhabi. Where's the person? Yeah, yeah, hello, all those people. Oh, it's uh, oh, there's Abu Dhabi. Hello, Francis. Hello, how are you? It's going Hi, so lovely to see you all. And there's Patricia, Patricia and Sean O'Brien. <laughs> the so wonderful to see you, Peter. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> hour! That has been just the most gorgeous hour, Shirley. Thank you very much for hosting that. That has My been pleasure. wonderful. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Thank see you, everyone. Bye-bye.